we are continuing on through the book of Romans. Romans chapter 9 really dealt with the sovereignty of God. Now, what is the sovereignty of God? Does anybody know? <clears throat> sovereignty deals with God can do whatever he wants to do. You know, you can't put God in a box and say that God has to do this, this, or this. Because God is sovereign. God can do anything that he sees right to do. Amen. And we will agree with him when he does it because we know he chooses right. He always chooses right. He always chooses what's best for us in the long run. It says all things work together for good to those who are called of the Lord and called according to his purpose. So we know that God is constantly working things out for our betterment, even bad things. You know, even though we don't like for shoulders to be messed up or knees to be messed up, God is going to bring good out of that situation. It may be one of the doctors you talk to and share with them. It may be uh, somebody else you bump into in the waiting room or whatever. But we always know that God has the big picture and God is always working on the big plan to lift you up and to bring glory to his name. So as we begin here in Romans chapter 10, we're going to move from the sovereignty of God to the human responsibility that each one of us has. Let's see what it says there in Romans 10, 1. Brethren, my heart's desire and my prayer to God for them is for their salvation. Now, who is it that Paul is praying for so fervently that they will see the light? Who is it? The Jews. Yeah, it's the Jews. Yeah, he wants his people to be saved. And you know, it's tragic because the Jews were so devoted and are so devoted to God. They, if you looked at anybody and said, boy, they do what the Bible says, it would be the Jews. The Pharisees, they would set apart their entire life to try to follow and obey God in everything he said. The only problem is, and it's going to be pointed out by Paul, is the fact that keeping the rules and regulations, keeping the law, does not save you. It doesn't save you. And he points out very clearly in Scripture what it is that we know saves each one of us. He says in verse 2, for I testify about them, the Jews, that they have a zeal for God, but not in accordance with knowledge. In other words, he's saying the Jews very zealously follow after God, but they don't know what they're doing. They don't understand what it is you need to do to be saved. And so God lays out real clearly through the Apostle Paul what they're doing wrong and what they need to do to be saved. We can always back up to Abraham where it began with the Jews. What did Abraham do to be saved? Does anybody remember? Did he do some great work for God? No. No. What did he do? It says he believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. So Abraham was saved by faith in the word of God. When God told Abraham where to go and what to do, that he was going to give him a land, that he was going to give him descendants, what did Abraham do? Well, he packed up everything he had. He took his wife, he took his one nephew, Lot, and they left where they were living. And they went where they didn't know where they were going. They didn't know the land they were going to. But God led them and God directed them. And God brought them into the promised land. 
And so we see that Abraham believed God, and not only did he believe God, but he stepped out in faith and did what God told him to do. And that stepping out in faith isn't what saved him. The believing God is what saved him. The same way we're saved. How are we saved? By faith. By faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ. We don't work our way to heaven. We don't have to be baptized to be saved. We don't have to go to Sunday school to be saved. We don't have to go to church all the time to be saved. How are we saved? By faith in what the Lord says. Whatever God says, you can take it to the bank, you can receive it, believe it, and make it a part of your life. And God speaks to us through his word. And we move into relationship with him through his word. So it says, for not knowing about God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own, they did not subject themselves to the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who does what? Believe. Believes. You know, God makes it so simple that people stumble over it all the time. They think they've got to be good enough. They think years past, look at Christians. Well, I've got to cut my hair a certain way. I've got to wear certain clothes. And we were judgmental when people came to church. Well, look at them. They got shorts on. Or look at that long hair. Or look at that smoker. Or look at that guy that drinks wine. And we would throw all kinds of things towards people that call themselves Christian. And we would say they're not Christians because of actions they take. Well, you know what? We can't say who a Christian is or who a Christian's not. That's right. You know, what they believe in their heart that only God can read defines whether or not they are saved. It's not by outward actions that you can always judge whether or not a person loves and follows the Lord. It is by their internal relationship with Jesus Christ that lays out whether or not they love him and whether or not they follow him. We are saved by faith. We begin by faith. We go into what they call the uh, sanctification process, where you're putting off old things in your life, and you're putting on new things in your life, and how does that process work? By faith. You know, you say, Lord, please remove this desire for drinking. Thank you, in Jesus' name. By faith you pray, and what does God do? God does what we ask him to do. He removes those desires, and he transforms our heart, and he helps us to get rid of our stinking thinking and to start following after him, not because we have to, but because we want to. We love him, and we want to obey him. And that obedience doesn't save us. That belief in God at the very beginning is what saves us. So we begin by faith. We are sanctified by faith. We finish by faith. What does it say? Do you have faith Jesus is coming again? Yeah. Amen. We're looking for the Lord. We still have that faith. Even though it's been over 2,000 years. We believe what his word says. We believe he's going to rapture the church. We believe we're going to meet him in the air. We believe that he'll have a second coming where he stands on the Mount of Olives, just like he said. We believe it. We receive it. And that's what saves us. That's what saves us. Is that faith in Jesus Christ? is that relationship with Jesus Christ, not our works. Now, what problem does that present then for people that are zealous like the Jews are and they are depending on their works to save them? 
What does that mean? It means they aren't saved because they are depending on their works to save them. Now, do we have other religions that depend upon works to save them? Well, let me throw out a few to you. And if you want to dig deeper, you can. Catholics. Catholics. They believe in a works salvation. They believe you're saved by good works. They also teach lots of other things that are not biblical. They teach that saints, different ones like John Paul, who was the Pope before the one we have now. John Paul, that he is a saint that can intercede for them in heaven. What does the Bible teach? Does the Bible teach that? Mm -mm. What does the Bible say about the one who intercedes for us? Jesus. Jesus is the only one. So when you bring in heresy, even though you are zealous, now you look at the Catholics, they look very religious. They have their preacher, who is a priest, who they call father, which the Bible says don't call any man father except your father in heaven. But they call him father, and he looks religious, and they go through all these ritualistic ceremonies. Have you ever been to a Catholic wedding? Oh, it's just unbelievable, the ritual they get involved in. Well, even the Lord's Supper to them is a great ritualistic thing that they do. They believe the sacraments become the actual body and blood of Jesus Christ. That's kind of like we were talking this morning about Kenneth Copeland cutting himself and letting the blood drop into the wine and them drinking it. What is that all about? That is nuts. Yeah. And you know what? We're going to see the longer we live, the nuttier that people get because they're not really following God in faith. Islam. We went through a big deal here recently with them cutting people's heads off. Now, I hope that doesn't come back again, but they're so zealous for what they believe even though what they believe is in error. Look at Jehovah's Witnesses. Jehovah's Witnesses. They're knocking on your doors on Saturday mornings, or at least they used to. I hadn't seen one in a while. But why do they do that? Anybody know? Because that's the way they get saved. They are saved because they hand out all that literature. That's what they believe saves them. You know what? That's not what the Bible teaches. And we could go on. The Mormons. We have the Mormon witnesses. Now, I haven't seen any Mormons in a while. But they are knocking on doors. They are very fervent. They go through their two-year mission program. And they are zealous. They are committed to what they believe. But is what they believe, does it line up with Scripture? No, it does not. And so we need to be sure that what we do lines up with the Word of God. And we know that because we read it line for line. And we understand exactly what God says. God says there is no good work that we can do that will save us. Amen? It says the only way we are saved is by faith. By faith. Look at what it says. Verse 8, or verse 6. But the righteousness based on faith speaks as follows. Do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the abyss, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of what? The word of faith, which we are preaching, that if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, what does it say? You'll be saved. 
Now, what work is involved in that? There is no work. You're confessing with your mouth, you're believing in your heart, and you're saved. That's what saves us. That faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ. Do you believe Jesus rose from the dead? Yeah. Amen, we do. Do we believe he's coming again? Mm -hmm. Amen, we do. Do we believe he's preparing us a home in heaven? Yes. Amen. He said he would, he will, and he will come again and get us. So we are saved not by handing out Bible tracts, not by knocking on doors, not reaching out into our community. We are saved by faith in Jesus Christ and that alone. Plus nothing. Plus nothing. So he lays it out very clearly in Scripture. Verse 9. That if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart a person believes. Now you wonder where does that belief come from? It comes from your heart. Not the ticker from the center of you that is you. You believe that Jesus Christ raised from the dead, saved you, and that's what saves you. And though it says that, verse 10, for with the heart a person believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. Turn, if you would, to Philippians 3 for a moment. Philippians 3, 11. Let's look at what that says. Finally, my brethren, verse 1, or I'm sorry, verses 1 through 11. Philippians 3, 1 through 11. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things again is no trouble to me, and it is a safeguard for you. Beware of the dogs. Beware of the evil workers. Beware of the false circumcision. For we are the true circumcision who worship in spirit, in the spirit of God, and in the glory of Christ Jesus, and put no confidence, what? In the flesh. So he is saying, listen, there are Judaizers that are going around trying to add works to what you do so that you can be saved. Don't believe them. Don't trust them. You have everything you need for salvation already. It is not some external act that you can do, like circumcision, because when you are saved, what does God do? He circumcises your heart, is what it says in Jeremiah 31, 31. In other words, he cuts away the dead part of your heart and he gives you life that you can believe and receive and be transformed. He says, but whatever things were gained to me, verse 7, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them but rubbish so that I may gain Christ and may be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through what? Faith in Christ. In order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. So, Paul lays it out. You know what? Everything I did before to attain salvation didn't bring me to salvation. Why not? Why can't work save you? You know, there is a way that seems right unto a man, but the end thereof is death. It seems right to try to work our way to heaven, doesn't it? You know, to try to be good enough, to do the things we're supposed to do, it is natural for our flesh to want to get involved in our salvation. But we need to remember, our flesh cannot save us. 
Teaching a Sunday school class cannot save you. Going on visitation cannot save you. Giving more money to the church cannot save you. And believe you me, there have been per people in churches that have done all those things and thought they were going to be saved by them. But that's not the case. The only thing that saves us is faith in Jesus Christ. Amen. And praise God, that's enough. That's all we need. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for each one that is here today. And we thank you that we are saved by faith. Lord, increase our faith. Help us to grow into the Christians you want us to be. Not because we have to do that to be saved, but because we long to lift you up to a lost and dying world. And Father, you know every heart and every need in our congregation. I pray that during this invitation, you would be glorified. For it's in Jesus' wonderful name we pray. Amen. Let's stand. We'll sing a hymn of invitation. If God is speaking to your heart, be faithful to do what he asks you to do. What number, Matthew?